We've been studying in a short three-week series the issue of sin. And in the midst of our sermon series, we've been talking about sin and salvation. But you know, every person in this room, as we've noted every time as we've began, is affected by sin. It's either we're the ones involved in sin or our lives are touched by those who are involved in sin And sometimes it seems as if sin will never leave us alone. So we started talking about sin. And last week, as we began on Sunday morning, we made it to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we slowly walked through that chapter. And we talked about the depiction of sin being in the midst of the church. The church being those who are Christians, those who are children of God, that means when sin is in the midst of you and me. And in the midst of that discussion, we talked about a word called withdrawal. It's the ending part of this chapter in the midst of verses 4 and 5, and the same thing in the midst of verses 11 through 13 in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now that is a hard thing to deal with, isn't it? And that leaves us with a position because we understand that the people in which have sin in their lives and those people in which will not let sin out of their lives should not be in the midst of a Christian lifestyle. But that does not mean we are not exempt from seeing them on a time-to-time basis. Maybe we're going to see them at work. Maybe we're going to see them at the store. Maybe they're in our families. It does not leave us exempt without leaving some ideas or questions in our mind of what do we do now? What do we do when we're in a position of verse 12, when we cannot, or verse 11, 12, and 13, when we cannot be amongst a person that's described as wicked? You know, as we're beginning our discussion, we understand that one law of God does not exempt another law of God. And as we begin our discussion, I want us to note first, there's something we have to remember. And it goes along with the scripture reading that was found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. The very first thing we need to remember, in the midst of talking about people who are living lives in sin, we have to act like a Christian. We have to act like Christians. It doesn't matter what our world is doing. It doesn't matter what other people who are supposed to be called Christians are doing. It matters what we are doing. It matters what you are doing. It matters what I do. And in 1 Corinthians 16, in 13 and 14, we find several depictions of things we can do. Listen to this as it was read just a moment ago again. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. In the midst of this, we see the very first depiction of acting like a Christian. A Christian, number one, watches. He's aware. He's looking around. He's surveying what's going on. He sees things for how they are. You know, sometimes we try to justify things in our mind, and we talked about that in our classroom study this morning in the auditorium. Sometimes we try to justify things to make them easier for us to digest. But the Christian needs to remember, we need to see things for how they are. If it is sin, it is sin. If it is not, it is not. Now you and I both understand, sometimes it's not as black and white as yes or no. So we have to be people who are willing to watch. We have to be watching ourselves. We have to be watching others. We have to be watching in the midst of the Word of God so we understand what sin is and what things are. So the first depiction I want us to remember, we watch. But number two, we stand fast. The idea given by the wording of stand fast is there's a platform in which we can stand, and we're standing upon that platform. 
There's only one platform the Christian has the ability to stand upon, and that is the words of God. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you say. But what ultimately becomes the part of our discussion, and we're talking about how, how to handle people that are in sin, I have to be willing to stand on the Word of God. Nothing more, nothing less. So I need to watch, I need to stand, and I need to quit like men. That's an interesting phrase, but it gives us the idea, act like someone of your age. It's time for us to act like Christians. You know, act like a mature individual. Act like someone who actually knows what they're doing. Act like someone who's willing to be responsible for their actions. And then we find this depiction, be strong. See, we find the depiction of quit ye like men, act like men. And then we see the depiction, be strong. They are two different, entire different discussions in their own. Being strong means doing the tough things even though they're hard. Doing the tough things even though they're hard. And you and I know what that means. As a child of God, sometimes doing the tough things means I'm not going to do what my world is doing. Sometimes being strong means I'm going to do things that my world is not doing. But listen to these two. Sometimes being strong means I'm not going to do what other so-called Christians are doing. And sometimes being strong means I'm going to do things that other Christians are not willing to do. We have to watch what we're doing. We have to be willing to stand on the midst of God's truth. I have to be willing to act like who, the person that I'm supposed to be. And I have to be strong. But you know, the writer in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 does not leave us with those things. Because in that particular discussion, it's almost as if so far... It's an emotionless discussion. We're going to do these things no matter what. We're going to be rigid. We're going to be adhered to the law. But then we see verse 14. Let all your things be done with love. You know, in the midst of the discussion of what is a child of God supposed to do when another child of God is wrapped up in sin... This depiction carries with it more weight than any. The first four, the watching, the standing, the acting, and the strength, are qualities. Are qualities. But love is something that's more than just a quality. Now love does not mean we're going to embrace and characterize as if they're still one of our own and act like nothing is happening but love is a word that carries with it and denotes the idea that I'm going to tell them the truth. That I'm going to tell them the truth. And you know, when you're caught in sin, the number one thing that we need is the truth. We need the truth. This word love means brotherly love, affection, goodwill. And it carries with it the idea of a benevolent work. We're going to give everyone. This is the person in sin. This is the person not in sin. This is the Christian. This is the non-Christian. We're going to give everyone a benevolent act of love. So as we begin this morning, I want us to remember first of all, when we're talking about what we're discussing this morning, we're Christians. It doesn't matter if we're talking about with the withdrawal process. It does not matter if we're talking about someone who wants to become a child of God. It does not matter if we're talking about someone who's caught up in a sin and makes it right with the Lord. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a visitor who comes in the midst of our assembly. The main focus in which I want us to remember is everyone here that's a child of God should act like a child of God. So let's move to our second idea. Number two, we need to have the right words have the right words. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians and find chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And in the midst of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to find a discussion. And this discussion is going to give us some ideas of how we handle those that are living in sin. Now, I want us to admit, first of all, as we begin in this section, this is hard. It's not easy. It's not something we're going to really enjoy, 
But you know what? The main emphasis of what's happening here is there's a soul at stake. There's a soul at stake. So we begin looking at this chapter, and notice with me 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're going to find all of this hinges on the words of God. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. I want you to notice as we begin in this first section of chapter 3, we're beginning with the word of God. As we continue through verses 2 through 5, we're going to notice the Word of God is the thing that gives confidence. The Word of God is the idea that directs our lives. And the Word of God is that which they have commanded these people to live in the midst of. So we're asking the question, what do we do with those that are in sin? Well, I need to have the right words. That's the main speech that I'm going to have. Now that only comes from God's Word. But you may be asking, what does this chapter have to do with what we're talking about? Notice with me verses 6 through 7, the corrections. We find here, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not, <coughs> and not after the traditions which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly, among you. The idea is given here. If there's one who is not acting as a child of God should act. If there's one who is not living as a child of God should live. If there's one who is living in the midst of sin, there needs to be some correction taken there. And the idea is given here in this particular section is that we withdraw ourselves from them. Now that's the same depiction that we found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we noticed last week. But that still leaves us with those questions. Well, what do we do when we run into these people? What do we do when we continue in these people? What do we do when we see them? And we get the answer that comes in from verses 8 through 10 of this particular section. The actions. Notice with me in verse 8 as we begin. There's some actions that they did while they were among these people. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. But with labor and travail and day and night that we may not be chargeable to any of you. And not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you that if anyone would not work, neither should he eat. So first we notice the actions that they gave. In the midst of being among these people, they had needs. And they worked for their needs. But we continue on and we see the conclusion, and that's where we needed to make our way to in this chapter. Look at with me verses 11 through 18, and we want to center in upon two verses as we go through here. We find in the depiction, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work, and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary, or verse 12, or verse 13 back, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And now notice verse 14 through the end of the section. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. You know, you may be wondering why I took us to First Thessalon or Second Thessalonians chapter 3 to discuss the idea of how we treat people who are living in sin. How we treat people in which we as children of God should not be inviting in in an intimate relationship with us as is being depicted. The nature is comes in verse 13 and verse 15. Read with me again verse 13, and I want us to notice one thing. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. What is the well-doing that's being discussed here? The well-doing that's being discussed is the child of God that's having to not associate with the unfaithful. Now, that's not an easy thing, but notice how he depicts it. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now that sounds awful hard, doesn't it? 
And it almost sounds like it's a contradiction in our minds because it doesn't seem like this is well-doing. But when we remember the purpose of all of this, we see the well-doing. This is for the safety of a soul. You know, when we get in the midst of this discussion, we have to understand a soul is on the line. And I would hope, just as I expect you to hope, that everyone would do the best they could to make me a child of God again if I was living in sin. So we see the depiction, be not weary in well-doing, but the emphasis is given in verse 15. Read this with me. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. We're talking about the person here that we have withdrawn ourselves from and notice the reaction that we're still having with them. Withdrawal does not mean, withdrawal does not mean we're going to cut you off, we're never going to talk to you again, and you are dead to me for the rest of your life. Read verse 15 again with me. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. You know, it's a hard situation to be in, isn't it? But we understand from this very passage, these are people that we may have contact with again. And notice the reaction we're supposed to have to them. We're supposed to admonish. Now we have to remember where we began. We are all Christians. And we're looking for a way in which we can have the right speech to talk to these people in which are living in sin. The idea is not hate. It's not aggravation. It's not a disdain or a discare. But it's a time in which we can come to these people and be concerned about them as if they were a, notice the word in verse 15, brother. The treatment should be fair. The treatment of those, that are in, of those that are in sin should be concerned enough for us to make sure it's right. So we need to have the right speech. We need to have the right speech. We also need to have the right vision. When we're thinking about dealing with those that are in sin, it takes a vision. Because we need to understand what we see and what we do is being seen. So go with me to Matthew chapter 18. And I want us to notice verses 15 through 17. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. I want us to notice before we begin reading this, that this is personal. The discussion that we're having right now is personal. This involves you and this involves me. And this involves someone who is in sin and was a part of the body of Christ. Now this involves someone in which we're supposed to care for, we're supposed to love. It involves someone in which when we're with them, we are to admonish them because we're concerned about their souls. But I want us to notice the right vision. Read with me Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. Then in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it unto the church. But if he, or if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a public, publican. You know, the treatment that's being found here is the idea of I'm not going to have any association in the idea of a religious context as if the Jews would with the heathens and the publicans. The idea is given here that we're not going to have that relationship that the Jews would have with the heathen and the publican. Now, you may be scratching your head for just a minute and wondering, why, why is this even a part of our discussion? Well, I understand that the context of Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, is of a personal nature. It's of a personal nature. And I also understand that the context of what's happening in Matthew chapter 15, verses, or Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. This is not something that's going to happen and just be done with. But it's something that takes our time. It's something that takes our time. 
But what I do understand is this involves everyone. Have the right vision. This involves every one of us. Every one of us has to be equal with our treatment. Every one of us has to be equal with our speech. And we all have to be equal with our decisions. You may be wondering also why any of this is being done. The whole emphasis of what's happening here in the right vision is that those that are in sin will come back unto the Lord because we're trying to give them the main treatment. Now let's notice also the main concept. Here is where this gets even more personal for you and me. Go with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and look at verses 16 through 20. And we're going to notice five different things as we walk our way down through James chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. Begin with me in James 5, verse 16. And we're going to see a depiction here. James 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth in the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The whole idea that is being presented here is to find a way to convert the soul from sin and find a way to bring them back into the saved. The idea of withdrawal being a stark cutoff of people from our lives is not as we find in these passages. We are talking about something that's personal. We are talking about individuals who are living lives in sin and need to be, now notice the word, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, we need to be willing to convert those that are in sin. As we mentioned a few weeks ago, the main problem that exists in this discussion is a problem of the heart. And that problem of the heart can be on both the side in which we sit this morning and the side of those that are in the midst of sin. Those that are in the midst of sin have a problem of the heart. And their heart is not truly given over unto the Lord. And it may be the case that with us, we may have a problem of the heart. But we need to make sure the things in which we're doing, we're doing so appropriately. We see the ultimate answer found in James chapter 5, verse 20, of all of the things done in a discipline or in a corrective nature in verse 20. Let him that know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This is about the soul. And this is about sin, and this is about salvation, and it's about you and me. Let's notice in the final point, the having the right mind. The main attitude in which we're trying to look at. The main attitude in which we're trying to look. Look with me in Galatians chapter 6, and let's read verses 1 through 5 together. Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5. We find there, brethren, if any... If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think to himself, or think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let, let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not rejoice in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. You may be wondering, why does this have anything to do with the idea of our discussion this morning? So let's back up and look at the passage in a little bit of detail. 
As we've already mentioned, it goes without saying, but we're going to say it anyways, this is personal. Notice the wording. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore. Notice that depiction. Where is the weight being placed? Where is the weight being placed? Now we understand that the weight of sin is placed upon the individual that is in sin. And we're not going to have to bear the burden of that individual sin come the time the Lord judges all of us in the day of judgment. But the idea is given here that you and me, we're going to have to bear some of this weight too. Because our fellow Christian is lost in sin. I think we need to say that again. Our fellow Christian is lost in sin. This is a crucial point of what's being found here. This is personal to you and me. But it's not just personal. All of this is about the right attitude. The right attitude. Now you and I both know we can have one of two attitudes. It can be good or it can be bad. Now, I know with that statement, I paint a very broad brushstroke with good and with bad. But we understand in the midst of our discussion, we can either treat people as if to run them away, or we can treat people as if to bring them back to Christ. Notice the rest of the verse. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. The depiction being made here is we must consider ourselves and have the right mind, have the main attitude, have an attitude that's concerned about the soul. You know, this particular concept and this particular idea, it's going to eventually, in some way or form, affect every one of us. And we understand when there's sin in any life, the main implication should be to do right. It doesn't matter what someone else has done. You and I must do right. It is our responsibility to do right. If they're in your family, do right. Treat them as they should be treated. Encourage them to come back to the Lord. Encourage them to do what is right. If you're going to see them down the road or see them in the store, it's time to encourage them to do what is right. The whole idea that's centered amongst this idea of withdrawal or church discipline or whatever you may call it is to bring this soul back to its maker. And that means you and I, each one of us, as a collective whole and as individuals, we must do that which is right. I know this morning we discussed something that to a degree is hard to discuss Especially given the circumstances knowing that two of our own are living in sin. But you know this morning it may be the case that one of us as well is living in sin. And we may need to make that right with the Lord. If you are a child of God this morning and there is sin in your life, whether it be personal or whether it be public, make it right with the Lord this morning. There's no better time than right now so you can leave this morning and know all is well, and you can know as you leave, I have done right. You may not be a child of God this morning, and you may be wondering about that. You may have questions. You may be noticing something on the front wall here that talks about what the Bible depicts, hearing the word, believing it, repenting of your past sins, confessing the name of Christ, and being immersed in baptism to become a child of God. You may need to do that this morning, or you may need to talk about this morning. There's no better time than right now to do that. You know, that's not an idea of being publicly embarrassed. You know, when you walk down those aisles, it's not about being embarrassed. It's about you and a church family making your life right with the Almighty God. If you need to become a child of God, or you need to make your life right with the Lord, why don't you do so as together we stand and sing. Sorrows like sea.